welcome everybody. Thank you very much for being here. We have a wonderful guest tonight. But first off, it's hump day happy hour. I'm Chad Duplantis. This is Dr. Jennifer Bell. JV, Hi, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Thawed out. Hopefully I'll have oh, power the whole time. Goodness. Hopefully I won't give uh, our good friend Deuce a little bit of vertigo tonight. Because last <laughs> week, apparently I was You're a little upset. Yeah, a little, little jumpy, a little jumpy. So, JV, tell us about your week. What happened this well, week? Well, first off, what are you drinking? For all of my friends that were making fun of me last week, I have a Basil Hayden Old Fashioned with the real official cherries that I ordered. It was embarrassing, frankly. When you show me that bright pink Old Fashioned, it was embarrassing. Well, do you realize that all the grocery stores were like closing and I had minimal choices? You don't I had make to put your own. Mar uh, a maraschino cherry in it or however you say that, but Mercy. that's what I had to do. Uh, you know, I got to do what I got to do. So anyways, uh, tonight I am official. So there you go. I mean, it took me a while to make. I poured it right before the show. So we need to send a picture of that to nachos because I'm pretty sure even though you may have won the challenge, you went down a couple of notches on your. I'll take it. I, I don't care. I don't care. Deuce, did you hey, hear that, man? Everything. It's Basil Hayden and I've got the real cherries, buddy. There you go. So uh, what, what are you drinking tonight, JB? Oh, I always do white. My dad came to visit me at the office today and he said, so let me get this straight. We have a, a beer drinker a red wine drinker and a white wine drinker because my mom definitely joined the Facebook group. So now hey. that you're talking to me, hey, mom and dad. Hey, um, hey, I, hey. I told them to watch the first 15 minutes because the rest is really boring to them because they're not dentists. So um, tonight I'm drinking white wine in honor of my dad who would expect nothing less. And and your your maiden name was what, Sat Satterfield? Satinfield. Satinfield. Yeah. Well, here's to Mr. and Mrs. Satinfield. So thank you for joining us tonight. We're they honored. also delivered quite a treat today because, um, so quick backstory, I'm from Lexington, North Carolina, which uh, is self-proclaimed perhaps the um, capital of barbecue, at least in North Carolina and much of the Southeast. I will concede that it is a particular type of barbecue different from Texas so don't even get me started on that I think our guests would argue that I, I know this yeah. is going to be contentious I am very aware of this but let me let me digress for a minute Lexington style barbecue is shoulder only which I prefer over our eastern friends who like the whole hog with all the veins and the fat and all the other stuff and it's a tomato and vinegar based sauce, but it's real thin. It's not like Texas where you have the thick sugary coating. It's, it's much more of a above a marinade. So my business partner who was throwing shade at me all week, all the last couple of weeks about the fact that I've never taken her to the barbecue festival in, in Lexington, posted on Instagram how I've never taken her there. Well, my parents follow us on Instagram and decided that if I couldn't come through on the promises of our hometown, they would. So tonight they bestowed upon my family and her family a full barbecue dinner, all the fix-ins. We even have barbecue slaw, which y'all have probably never seen. Um, it's a red slaw, but it was delicious. Plates were cleaned, bellies were full and happy. So I I'm just really happy right now. I feel the love of home and the comfort food and all the things that come with that. You know, um, that's, a, that's a very heartwarming story, but there's something that I just learned about you that when you start talking about home, your accent goes to a different part of North Carolina <laughs> than I've ever heard before. You know, my business partner, he's really good about that. When he's around country folk, he starts talking real country. It but you just, right got, you just got real backwoods on me. So I'm very proud of you and I'm very impressed. Well, thank you. I did grow up saying Selman. And yeah, so, yeah I, I mean, I, you didn't I, come far, you know. I, I'm very impressed. So, <laughs> uh, what what do you got in the news for us this week? Well, how was your week? First, can we? Oh, hear my it? week, was your week my okay? week, my week has been crazy. Uh, it, you know, we were off all last week. 
hit the ground running on Monday morning, started off with molar endo, which is not really my favorite thing to do, but I'll do it in a pinch. Yeah. Uh, you know, just been blowing and going, working through lunch basically. And, you know, it's one of those days where some people say, thank God it's Friday. Tomorrow I will say, thank God it's Thursday because, uh, because Friday is a different kind of work. We, we haven't knock on wood because my heart goes out to all the people that did have a lot of problems. We were very fortunate. Um, we didn't have any busted pipes that, that we know of yet. And, uh, we're, we're, we're in good shape here at the homestead and we were in good shape at the office. And I know that that can't be said about a lot of dentists. So Do if you're you watching feel like you, most you, of the happen. dentists in Texas are climbing out or, um, is it 50 fifth? Like what's the situation down there right now? It, it was 72 degrees today. So, um, you know, we have schizophrenic weather for sure. Um, you know, everybody, I, I don't know of anybody in Texas that worked last week. If, if somebody did, then kudos to you because we just really couldn't. But everybody is back at it this week, as far as I know, except for those that had office problems. We have a guy in a neighboring town and his whole office flooded and a bunch of people reached out to him and let him, you know, shelter his patients and their practices. But, you know, there was, there were a lot of horror stories, but I'm just glad we're back and we're safe. Well, hopefully you guys will continue to take care of one another and dig Yeah, we will. That's what we mess. do. That's right. Whatever mess you have left. And then it, it was 68 here today. I mean, it was beautiful. And unlike your snowy weather, we just had rain on rain on rain on rain. So we're kind of flooded at this point. And guess what? It's supposed to rain tomorrow and all weekend. So... I heard that I have a I have a, a friend that's taken her daughter to the a soccer tournament in North Carolina this weekend. She's like, it's supposed to rain every day. I said, those poor people have had rain every day. Well, and the rain won't be the problem. It's the field condition that is already there because we've had so much rain. While you were having all that in snow, we had all of that in rain, and so yeah, they're just, playing on turf fields, and it's uh, and so it's rain or shine. Wait, what so, city? Uh, Greensboro. Not yeah, far. about an hour so, from here. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, are you ready to talk about the news? Yeah, let's talk about it. Let's talk about the news because uh, I want to see what's going on in the dental world. Okay. Well, so a couple of things actually hit my feed today. So I want to talk about that first because it sounds like it might be something we're all kind of managing and dealing with. Um, so Dr. Bicuspid posted today about in his news feed about uh, one out of 12 dental hygienists have left the field altogether. And then the ADA and ADHA also posted um, today about kind of a, they're doing a webinar and, um, and a discovery series on the fact that dental hygiene has been disproportionately um, relocated, I guess, in COVID. And so let's talk about a couple of the parameters that are associated with that. So um, in the survey that was put out, um, through, I, I believe it was through the Journal of, Hi of Dental Hygiene, um, or at least they published the data. But out of that came several pieces of key information. One was the fear to return to work. And I think dental hygiene in particular had um, maybe a, an increased level of fear to return. The other was in general, women and the dental hygiene profession is 98% female, um, which I didn't realize was so, I mean, I knew it was predominantly female, but I didn't realize it, realize it was 98%. Um, we had talked about months ago how disproportionately women had been affected by COVID in the work field. Almost 800,000 women, close to a million, had been um, unable to return to work. And a lot of that is because they had to stay home and take care of kids whose husbands maybe couldn't or had to have special conditions for that or were caring for parents and couldn't return to a job that might put them at risk for contracting COVID. So um, I think that that's an interesting phenomenon because I don't know how you felt, but I would have said 12 to 24 months ago, there was a glut of hygiene, hygienists on the market looking for jobs, that the schools were pumping out a lot of graduates looking for work. And in some cases, we had more applicants for that position that we would post more than dental assistants or admin. I think we're gonna see a change. And I think um, 
If we have open positions, I think it's going to be more difficult to find qualified candidates to take the jobs. I also think it may force employers to start to consider other challenges that come along with helping uh, females come back into the workforce and managing childcare issues at the same time. So, you know, we'll continue to look at the data and, and post it out as we can. But I think it's, um, I, th I think it's an interesting piece of data that we're going to have to consider as we continue to try to move back to 100% production in our practices, which hopefully in the next six months, most of us will realize. Um, I also think that it would be interesting to see how many female dentists also respond to a similar survey about um, challenges that have come from that because I'm a two female doc office. And I can tell you that we've had um, we've definitely had challenges with the return to work. So um, anyway, came out in two different news feeds that I follow pretty closely. And I thought that was interesting and, and might impact, you know, our fellow dentists who tune in on a weekly basis. That is definitely interesting. And, you know, what it tells me is it's kind of like the airlines, you know, there's going to be a pilot shortage in a few years, You're big right. time. And I believe there's going to be a hygiene shortage in, in a few years, big time. So if there are people that are looking for a profession, hygiene is definitely a great profession to go into because obviously as the demand goes up, their asking price is going to go up as well. And I think that that's something that we need to be prepared for. And I just hope that insurance companies are listening as well. You know, so, you know and the, it's been on the top 10 jobs in Forbes for a decade or two decades, whatever. Because for, you know, a two-year post-high school degree, it is a well-compensated field. Um, I do think that because it's heavily female uh, employed, that it's posing some interesting challenges in scenarios like pandemics and other uh, things that kind of put a lot of pressure. I mean, a lot of the, you know, we, we definitely had three females who were out on maternity leave during COVID one has not returned. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that then you have to find adequate child care and they aren't going back to school on a full-time basis. And then if you have a, a husband who's traveling still or working, there's just so many different nuances that you're trying to balance. So anyway, I thought that was really an interesting piece and, and certainly will impact whether you're female or male, it impacts who you're employing on a daily basis. So um the other thing that I thought uh, was interesting about that survey that's worth mentioning is of the dental hygienists that they surveyed, only 3.1% had actually contracted COVID, which is just slightly statistically higher than the average population, but still much lower than most healthcare professions. So if the fear of returning to work because you're going to contract COVID it would seem thus far that that's, that has not been realized in practice. And I do think that, that that piece of it is at least worth mentioning. We can't control the schools or child care or virtual school and all the other things that we're balancing. But, you know, it certainly would seem that the PPE parameters that we've always had in place and the tightening up of those items are continuing to make our professionals safe. So that, that was a pretty good statistic to see. Um, another you know, uh, JB, real quick, I'd like to say I, I noticed that she was watching, but Grace from uh, Dental Mommies in Mommy Business, Dennis in Business, yeah, yeah mommy, whatever. What, I, I yeah, probably yeah, yeah. said it wrong, but she would be great to get on in a few weeks again and talk about that, just because you know she deals with so many uh, mommies in the workforce, and I'd love to hear her thoughts on it. So I think that that would be you know really a good good point of discussion in a few weeks. So and it's an, it continues to be an ongoing challenge. Um, and it's different from maternity leave and the other things that maybe have um, existing business models that you can kind of pull from. There is no help when it comes to pandemic issues because there's no history, right? So we're making it up as we go. Um, and feeding off of one another in real time to figure out how we're managing it. So I think that's a great idea. Um, and to answer the question that came in, they they did not contract COVID through their office. So anyway, that's worth mentioning. Um, 
Another interesting thing that came out this week was that there's a new strain in California, at least predominantly what they're seeing in California with um, new tests that are coming out for COVID. They do have a new strain. Um, so I, I don't want to get super fringy, but let's talk for a minute. So a new strain has been identified in California. Um, they are showing that it is more contagious. And I was listening to a virologist and pathologist a few weeks ago who noted that that's the proper evolution of a disease is that it will go from less contagious, but very deadly to more contagious, but less deadly as the evolution of the virus moves along. So you could look at the Spanish flu, you could look at lots of other viruses that we have and including the flu virus, um, the traditional flu, um, as it has existed in the human population over time, in theory, the virulent strand becomes less deadly, maybe more contagious, but less deadly. So I think that's interesting that they're starting to see that the strand in uh, California is more contagious. I can't correlate whether that will then mean that it's less deadly, but it certainly has been suggested from folks way smarter than me that that is the natural evolution of a virus and that it will move to more contagious, but in theory, it should become less deadly and less, uh, you know, an unfortunate thing to contract, if you will. So I'll take more contagious, but less deadly for 500 JB. <laughs> I'll do double jeopardy on that one, actually. Yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah. Uh, I've got a point of conversation that I'd like to bring up towards the end of the show that regards around a news topic that I sent you because I think it would be a good talking point. Oh, yeah. But I know we've got our guest waiting in the wings. So let's, uh, let's hold off on that last story till the end. You got it. I am going to introduce our guest. Um, this gentleman I've known for, oh, I don't want to give away my age, but I've known him for 25, 26 years. I was just a peon dental student when I first met him. But Dr. Robbins practices dentistry in San Antonio. I think he said he is not full-time anymore, but he is also an adjunct clinical professor in the Department of Comprehensive Dentistry at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio Dental School, which last I checked is the number one dental school in the nation, which just means that they only did that survey one time and that's the way that it ranked. Um, he graduated from the University of Tennessee Dental School in 1973, did a rotating internship at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Leavenworth, Kansas and a two-year GPR at the VA hospital in San Diego. He has published numerous articles, lectures all over the world, co-authored a textbook called Fundamentals of Operative Dentistry, A Contemporary Approach. And I think the textbook that most of us have heard about most recently is Global Diagnosis, A New Vision of Dental Diagnosis and Treatment Planning, which was also, they were both published by Quintessence. He's won several awards. Uh, including the, I'm probably going to say this wrong, but 2002 Texas Dentist of the Year, I won't say that wrong, 2003 Honorary Thaddeus V. Wecklu, did I say that right? Mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, Fellowship Award from the Academy of General Dentistry, the 2010 Saul Sluger Award given by the Seattle Study Club, and the Southwest Academy of Restorative Dentistry 2015 President's Award, and the 2016 Academy of Operative Dentistry Award of Dentist, uh, Excellence. He is a diplomat of the American Board of General Dentistry, past president of the American Board of General Dentistry, the Academy of Operative Dentistry, the Southwest Academy of Restorative Dentistry, and the American Academy of Restorative Dentistry. Obviously, this guy is pretty well accomplished, and it is an honor to know him and an honor to have him on the show. Dr. Robbins, how are you, buddy? It's great to be with both of you guys tonight. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Well, we were, we were so excited. And I have to give a special shout out to all of our really good friend, Dr. Uh, Dr. Eric Rindler out of San Antonio, because he kind of waved his magic wand and called Bill and said, I didn't want to tell Eric that I probably could have done the same thing. But, you know, I mean, I just want to give Eric the credit. But yeah. so thank you. 
Give him a moment. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rindler. So, uh, Bill, tell us a little bit about your journey in dentistry beyond your bio. You know, it's dangerous to ask an old guy <laughs> about what he's been doing for the last 50 years in dentistry. So um, you ask that at your own peril. Um, I, I did, but that's why I asked it. <laughs> right, so actually, I do enjoy this story because it's about my family, actually. My grandfather was a dentist. Um, my two uncles were dentists and my father was a dentist. So I grew up in a dental community and I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas. So I don't really get your, what they're talking about with an accent, Jennifer. I don't yeah. hear the accent from you. It sounds totally normal, doesn't it? Uh, it's not normal for me. Right. But I, um, I grew up in a dental family. In fact, our home and office were together where my dad practiced, you know, and so I hung out with my dad all the time. I was at his feet all the time. His patients loved him. He was a blue collar dentist and his patients just loved him. And when I was growing up and I'd be hanging out with him in the office, um, especially when I got in dental school, one of um, his patients would say, you know, he'd walk out of the room, one of his patients would say, you know, in the country thing, son, you gonna make a dentist? And I'd say, yes, sir, I'm going to dental school. And he'd say, if you're half the dentist your dad is, you'll be a hell of a dentist. And I heard that a lot. And my, they loved my father because he really was a wonderful man. And so um, I just assumed, I went to school in Memphis, <clears throat> which is only about two and a half hours from Little Rock where I grew up. And so I just assumed that after I graduated from dental school, I would go back and go to work with him. He had room and that's what you did 50 years ago. And when I was a third year dental student, he said to me, you know, I think you ought to look into these dental internships. And I said, I don't know what that is. What are you talking about? And he said, well, it, it's a place where you go for a year to a hospital and you learn what they have to teach you. And if, if at the end you, you, you enjoyed it, but you're ready to come home and come back and go to work. And I said, well, okay, how do I do that? And he said, you go to the VA hospital and there's one in Memphis and you apply. So I said, okay, back in those days, you did what your dad told you to do. So I went and applied and I actually got into, um, it wasn't even called a GPR at that point. It's called an internship. <clears throat> And I went to Leavenworth, Kansas. And I thought Leavenworth, Kansas sounded like the worst place on earth to go to with all the prisons. But it turned out to be the center of the dental universe for the Veterans Administration at that time. It was affiliated with UMKC Dental School and it had every residency there. You know, oral surgery, endo, pros, perio. It was a very rich learning environment and I loved it. <clears throat> and it was one of those deals where we went through rotations. So you'd have three months as an oral surgery resident and then three months as a perio and so on. So during that year, I wanted to be each of those four things. And so at the end, I said, well, I mean, maybe, maybe I want to be a general dentist because I really like all these things. And so I had to pay a year back for that program. And during that second year, I applied for and got into the two-year GPR in San Diego. So I moved to San Diego. That was a country boy going to the big city. And, um, and it was the richest two years of my life professionally. Everything I do today is, is influenced and impacted by what I learned in those two years. And when I finished the program, I had to pay that back also, and they had to send me somewhere to do it. There was no place in California. And that's how I got to San Antonio. I got to come back to the VA hospital in San Antonio. And so I was on my road in academics. And soon after I got back to San Antonio, I got an appointment part-time at the dental school and I ultimately became director of the GPR at the VA in San Antonio. And that was my first real academic job. And by that point, I was hooked into that world. I loved academics and I never went home. And the reason I love telling that story is because my father gave me a pass and he didn't know what I needed to do, but he had a feeling that I needed to do something else before I came home. And he gave me this pass to go out and, and see the world. And I never went back. <clears throat> And I know that he would have enjoyed having me in the practice. I mean, we would have enjoyed working together, but it was never meant to be because once I got into the academic world, that's, that's what I loved. And so I spent the first 25 years of my career in academics. I, that was my first academic appointment as GPR director at the VA. I then joined the Air Force and I wanted to live in Europe. So we went, my wife and I went to Europe for a couple of years and then came back and I was um, sort of second in command of the two-year AGD program at Lackland. And then I left the Air Force and went to the dental school and became director of the AGD program at the dental school. So that's what I did for 25 years. <clears throat> and after 25 years, um, Jeff Rouse came to me. Jeff is a name that should be known to everybody. Yeah. 
he was one of my dental students. And he said, you know, if you ever decide to go into private practice, I'd love for you to consider going in with me. And in fact, I've got a spot that I'd like to offer you. And I never thought about <laughs> leaving the dental school. I saw myself as an academic guy. And I went home and told my wife about it. And she hated the dental school because I was getting paid squat. And I was there from seven to seven, you know, mm -hmm. running a residency program. She loved the idea of private practice. And she was a hygienist. And so um, we le I left the dental school um, and, you know, turned in my tenure and went into full-time private practice about 25 years ago. And we, we went in with Jeff for about four years, and it was a very rich time in our lives. Um, Jeff and I don't get to lecture much together anymore, but we're still very good friends. And we wrote the, we developed the global diagnosis system together and wrote the book together. And I ultimately um, went and he went back and did a process residency, and I built a, a little building, and that's where I am today in private practice. So I've had um, really the best of both worlds. I had a long time career as an academic guy. And then I've had the same length of career in private practice, and I love both of them. I really now, enjoy both. Do you stuff. hear your dad come through? Like when you're sitting to your side with patients or even in your academic world, do you hear yourself say things that you heard him say, you know, early in your life? Are there little bits of him that come out from time to time? Yes, I think that's true. That's what my family tells me. Um, <laughs> we have, we have a sort of a similar personality and yeah, I think that's true. And the other person that sits on my shoulder a lot, um, I think it's also important to talk about who are those people that have really impacted you mm -hmm. the most. And I know, I know Jennifer, you and Chad have people. I know for you, um, yeah. Chad, that, that, um, Chuck Wakefield is one of them, one of our yeah, very absolutely. Good friends. And I've had a handful of people that have had a giant impact on me. And certainly my father, I'd say, was the most important. My mother also. They're both amazing people. But um, when I joined the Air Force, uh, my boss ultimately was Jim Summit. And Jim was um, a colonel in the Air Force, and he was my boss in that two-year AGD program. So I was under him as sort of second in the program. And that would be back in the um, mid-'80s when, when that occurred. And that's how long Jim and I have been friends. And so he's actually the one, Jennifer, that sits on my shoulder and still whispers in my ear today, mm -hmm. um, like today, you know, I'm, I'm doing something that's not difficult, it's under the gingiva, and it's a hard place to get to, and I think I've gotten all the decay, and Jim is whispering, I don't think you've gotten it all yet, you, know? <laughs> you better get some, some dye out and find out, you know, and so I'd say yeah. Jim Summit, from a, from a moral integrity friendship point of view is the person that's had the most impact on me. And he's still um, alive and well. He's retired from the dental school, but he's still doing well. And then the other person I think that would be a commonality for you and me, Jennifer, would be John Coyce. And 100%. Coyce was the, the first world-class um, teacher that I had. And I didn't know him. I mean, I, the first time I heard him speak, I'd never heard of him. Mm -hmm. And I remember taking 23 pages of notes in that one day. And he was talking about things like biologic width that I was teaching residents and I thought I knew about and I knew squat about it compared to him. And so he became, you know, that person for me that's had a giant impact. And Frank Spear is also a yeah. wonderful teacher. Um, and I've, I have indeed learned a lot from him and more currently Kinzer. I think Coy, or Spear and Kinzer are an amazing pair. Um, but I'd say John Coyce is probably the one that's had the most impact on me. Yeah. And then the final one would be Jeff Rouse. Um, Jeff is among the most talented dentists intellectually that I've ever been around. And when we first started together, I had experience as a speaker and he didn't. And I've watched him grow from a, from a beginner public speaker teacher into, you know, among the best on earth right now. And um, so I've been blessed in my life with a lot of wonderful people. And those four that I mentioned, I think would be among the most important. You know, I, I got a funny story to tell you, Bill. Uh, you were you were telling your story, and you and I it, it, it must be kindred spirits because I'm telling you, you're saying something, and I'm like, as soon as he's done with this, I got to tell him this story. So I'm gonna tell you a story. When I was in dental school, I thought I wanted to go into oral surgery, and then I thought I wanted to go into endo, and then I thought I wanted to go into pros, and I had gone back to endo, and 
I went to go apply to Indo and I said, I don't want to do this. So I go into Dr. Summit's office and I said, Dr. Summit, I'd like to, I'd like to ask you to write me a letter of recommendation. And he takes the sheet of paper and he puts it down on his desk and he looks at me and he goes, well, what do you want to do? And he goes, is it for Indo? And I said, no, sir. And he goes, it's not. And I said, no. And he goes, well, I thought you were going into Indo. I said, well, I never told you that. He goes, well, you just look like the Indo type or something like that. I said, no. And he goes, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to do an advanced education in general dentistry. He goes, with honor, I will write that letter. And he goes, I am so glad you chose to do that. And he says, well, what do you, he goes, what do you really want to do? And I said, I want to be the best general dentist that I could ever be. And he says, all right. And he goes, now, where do you want to go to your residency? He goes, you're going to go learn from Dr. Robbins. And I said, well, I'm applying there. And Douglas had, it was doing the program at the VA. And I knew that you were still teaching there somewhat. And, and, uh, and so anyways, I ended up getting into the uh, Baylor and I went with Chuck Wakefield and the rest is history. But it's funny how all of the same people that we talked about run in the same circles. And, and it's just such a, a great, great story. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. And, and trust me, that's exactly what I was looking for. But what I want to get into, because, you know, you answered my first two questions through your story there. But um, tell me about this global diagnosis that you've been talking about and how that all came about and, and why this is such a hot topic right now. So back in the early 90s, when Coys and Spear were just becoming the thing, they were partners in practice together, they'd been residents together, and then they were partners in practice, and they were teaching together. And up until that time, complex interdisciplinary treatment planning cases were treated, treatment planned on the articulator on maxillary and mandibular cast mounted in centric relation. That's how prosthodontists treatment plan a patient on an articulator. And Coys and Spear were the first to say that we should not be treatment planning from condylar position forward. We should be treatment planning from incisal edge back. And that was a radical and revolutionary idea back in the early 90s. And it was a little bit slow to catch on and now it's become the standard. But when I first heard about it, it made such good sense to me. And I grew up in the, in the world of nathology. I never could do it. I never could do a nathologic wax up that was very good using a drop wax technique with the different colors of wax and all. I wasn't good at it. And it turned out that it was all nonsense anyway. I mean, nobody could do it. And so when I came up or I came up on these guys that were so much more common sense um, I was an early adopter. And then in the, about 1997, Jeff and I got together. That's when I went to practice with him. And um, we both started using facially generated diagnosis in our practice and started incorporating it into our teaching. And it was from Poison Spear that this concept that was revolutionary changed my life also. And as Jeff and I worked with facially generated diagnosis, Coys and Spears' initial emphasis was on incisal edge position. That was the starting point. And Jeff and I felt like there needed to be an equal emphasis on gingival levels. And so global diagnosis is not meant to take the place of facially generated diagnosis. All the credit goes to Coys and Spear. Global diagnosis is additive to facial treatment planning, facially generated treatment planning, with an emphasis on the gingival levels. So it's a systematic approach of looking at that more complex interdisciplinary patient. And Jeff and I believe that there are four global diagnoses that dictate all interdisciplinary treatment planning. And we can make a diagnosis on any patient based on asking and answering only five questions. And so that's the sort of the short story of global diagnosis. <clears throat> well, and the thing I appreciated about it, much to your um, praise of Coy's, I had never heard Coy's before when I heard him the first time, and probably you felt similar. The systematic approach to diagnosis and treatment planning um, just made good sense, and it was very logical. I felt the same way when I sat through your Friday lecture. I'm sure you don't remember me then, but uh, in Cary, North Carolina, the first time I heard you, it was a systematic and practical approach to looking at any facial aesthetic challenge and figuring out how you're going to get from point A to point B. And I, um, I, frankly, I applaud you for being able to put it into pragmatic terms that an everyday clinician can take 
you know, a four or five step question approach to being able to generate a treatment plan and also communicate to a patient how they're going to move them from point A to point B and the risks and pros and cons that are going to come along with that um, multi-step treatment plan. So my opportunity to applaud you as one of my mentors unbeknownst to you and to say that I appreciate such a pragmatic approach for GPs that are just looking for ways to be able to, to execute on a daily basis at a high level. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'd also say that I, Jeff Horowitz is missing some great stuff right now because he would be all, all over this. I mean, he is, I know that he, he follows, you know, that, that approach as well. So I, I really, I, I'm really excited and, you know, I'm, I know that I'm going to post the link below uh, tomorrow or this evening, but you have a study club on global diagnosis. Do you not? That meets weekly? Yeah, we do, as a matter of fact. And um, so there's a, a general dentist in Lawrence, Kansas named Jim Otten. And okay. Jim has taught at the Panky Institute for years. He's more recently taught at the Spear um, Institute or the, the Spear Education in Scottsdale. So Jim is an amazing educator. And we've been friends for a long time. And we're about the same point in our career. We we're starting to slow down a little. And we were thinking about three years ago, he and I and his wife and, and my wife got together for a weekend. And we were trying to figure out some type of um, consulting business or something that we could use um, in our later years to work with younger dentists in terms of diagnosis. We, we had all kinds of ideas, but we never could operationalize it. And during the pandemic, um, everybody's aware of, of Kirk Barrett and ACT Dental and the COVID relief conference that he put on. And he asked me to help with that. And so early on in that, I was involved. Every morning I would get up and it would be five hours. And I wouldn't be on all five hours every day, but I was on for a lot of it. <clears throat> and I gave quite a number of lectures on it. And so I had an audience that had never heard of me or seen me and they saw me every day. And sometime there would be 2,500 people um, mm -hmm. at a time on you know, these lectures. And so, you know, I got more exposure through that than I'd ever gotten before because I'm not really a national level guy like Coyser Spear. I'm more of a regional oh, baloney. guy. baloney. No, it's true. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm more of a regional study club kind of guy. And I'm, I'm happy to be that. It, it makes me happy. But um, about a couple of months into that in April, um, I called Jim up and I said, you know, I think this is a perfect time for us to implement what we're talking about. Let's start a virtual study club. I mean, we've got this big group of people that have been seeing our faces. Let's start it. So on June the 5th last year, we started Global Diagnosis Education, which is a virtual study club. <clears throat> and we meet once a week, not every, we, 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 we meet um, three weeks out of four. And we generally will have a couple of hour and a half. Uh, they, they last an hour and a half to an hour and 45 minutes. We'll have a lecture. Um, with maybe some questions. The second time we'll have another lecture with more questions and answers. And then the third will be a workshop and it will be treatment planning. And we have a template that we've created mm -hmm. to um, be able to use the global diagnosis system, both from an aesthetic and a functional point of view. Jim's real expertise is in function. He's a TMJ occlusion expert, and I'm not that. And so we've, uh, our, our talents have really been a wonderful synergy that we come together to bring the function in with the more aesthetic side. And so we generally have two sessions a month where we have a lecture and one where we do more of a workshop. And Jim is really good at the behavioral side too, in the management of the office and the management of patients and behavioral styles and all that. And so it's just been a wonderful um, experience for both of us. And um, so, yeah, it's still open. What we, we do, um, we video all of the lectures, and so we now have a library where everything has been done since last January the 5th. We have some guest speakers, obviously, along the way. We've had um, Jeff Rouse and others, Jim McKee, as guest speakers. And, um, and so there is a library of what we've already done, so a person could come at any point and start, you know, become a member and go back and look at the past videos and catch up. So that's, that's become among the most favorite of my educational experiences of my life. 
because my problem that I always felt is that when I go into a study club, like I did with you, Jennifer, or, or a meeting, it's five hours and I go and tell my story. And at the end, people think, yeah, that was cool. And then they go home on Monday and change is hard because mm -hmm. nobody is holding you accountable on Monday. Well, that's the difference between being in a study club because there's an accountability. Those that are really taking this seriously, and we have about 160 members. And the members that really take it seriously are sending in cases that we're then going over and they're implementing, you know, they're buying a Doppler, they're implementing the things that we're talking about. They're buying a COIS dental facial analyzer. They've never had an articulator in their practices before and now they do. And so that's the beauty of this and the real excitement for Jim and I, and that is we're starting to see real behavioral changes in our members, which I never see in the study club setting. That gives yeah, you so I, much I, satisfaction as a teacher, you know, it, to it have payoff. Yeah, absolutely. I looked at it last night, and I, that was a question that I was going to ask you: was that if if someone had not started from the beginning, would they be able to re, you know pick up pick up midway? But I looked at it last night. I think it it's one hundred ninety nine dollars a month, I believe, and I I think there was like a hundred dollar off on on Kirk's website, like ninety nine dollars a month. So that's what it is right now. That's right. $99. Yeah, and so I'll 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 put that link out there tomorrow and make sure we get some people over there. But but you know, I just uh, I wanted to to say a couple of closing things. One is thank you for what you've done to dentistry. Uh, Thank you for uh, for being who you are and remembering me after all these years, because, uh, you know, and, and I know that uh, we, we have a lot of mutual connections, but I, I think so highly of the people that you've run in circles with. And I don't know if you heard, but we're going to switch gears from dentistry for just a second. And right before you came on, Jennifer was talking about barbecue and, you know, you, you grew up in Little Rock. You know your barbecue. You went to school in Memphis. You definitely know your barbecue. Granted, it's a different type of barbecue, but we're going to scratch that because JV's up in North Carolina. We're in Texas. We're not going to argue about barbecue because we know that ours is better. But what I am going to ask you is when we go to San Antonio, where is the first place that you're going to take JB for Mexican food? Oh, for Mexican food. Yeah, that's that's a better question than for barbecue. I, I have to have a, a couple of other questions answered. And that is, yeah. what, are you there for the food, the experience, number one, um, the ambiance? And number two, are you there for um, Tex-Mex or are you there for more uh, interior Mexican food? So authentic. Those two. <laughs> authentic Mexican food. Okay, authentic Mexican food. Mm -hmm. um, there's a brand new restaurant in San Antonio, and that's probably where I'd take it. It's called Frida's, brand new, and it's high-end. It's not far from my office, too, so we could run by the office and have a, a – uh, you didn't ask me what I was drinking tonight. Oh. Got, what are you drinking, Bill? Yes, nothing. So nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> nothing. My wife would let me drink during the week, but – if you're we doing this on Friday night, it would be a dirty martini with blue cheese olives. So there you go. That's my drink. All right. So we would go by the office, and my partner Brad Beckel makes a great martini. And then after we we had the martini, we would go to Frida's and have a wonderful upscale Mexican restaurant meal. I, All right. Did you hear an invite, Chad? I, yeah, I, feel I like heard an invite. It's, it's on. Trust like, me, I heard going. it. We're going to yes. make it happen, and, and maybe, just maybe, we might bring Eric Rindler along. I, I don't want to make any promises. And poor Jeff, maybe he wants to come along, too. I don't know. Yeah. He can't yeah. say. Well, Jeff's Eric, included in we. Yeah. The thing about Eric is that Eric serves really fine wine. So if you come to my place, you're going to get a $15, $20 bottle of wine. If you go to Eric's, you're going to get a nice bottle of wine. So one night we get the martini at my office and the next night we go to his backyard, which is beautiful, by the way, got a beautiful pool. And we sit out there all evening and drink wine with he and Missy. I mean, there this sounds like the perfect trip. There There's you go. no better place on the planet than San Antonio, Texas, period. It's where I did our first, uh, first year anniversary for my wedding. We went to San Antonio, New Braun, New Braunfels. We did Green, Texas. 
I, I fell in love and splunking down in the yep. holes of Texas. Yeah, it's, well, a, it's a great place to live. Four it was right phenomenal. There. So, so Bill, you know, as we close out, do you have another minute? Because I think you might enjoy this. Absolutely. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, so I wanted to close out with this tonight. And then, and uh, it was, it was the last little bit of news. And Bill, I don't know that you've checked your, uh, okay, Eric Shire wants to join us too. I guess we could invite him too. Okay, fine. Oh. Let's have a big old party <laughs> in San Antonio. All right. But, um, but I don't know if you checked your email today, but the Texas State Dental Board adopted the rules that were proposed last week. So uh, there, were, there were some changes that have been made. So JB, do you have them in front of you? There were just a few. Yeah, well, I think the predominant changes. ones were modifying a little bit of the screening techniques coming into the office. So kind of lightening up on that a little bit. Um, they also talked about you, you have a shorter window of time if you contract COVID, I think prior to have been 10 days. Seven days now. Now it's down to seven. Um, it, it just felt like a little bit of loosening up, you know, just in general, kind of pulling back some of the restraints. Uh, you can have magazines in your waiting room now, people, and toys. So you got that I going. Think you can also have, you can have uh, family members come in. Correct. Yes. And, and they're yep. saying you don't have to do a pre rinse anymore. So yep. they're, yeah. they're, they made quite a few um you know, pullbacks from the more stringent um, recommendations. You know, it's interesting. So the, where I wanted to debate it is I just wanted to ask, you know, and Bill, you practice in Texas, so you, you'll get this, but here's my take on it. First is, is that I have a, a staff member who I, I love dearly and she's battling breast cancer. And I think it's of utmost importance because she's one of the first people that they meet in the office that we screen them appropriately prior to coming in, which they do the day before. So I feel that that is something that we've grown used to and we're kind of okay with it. And in her case, I'm going to keep it because it doesn't say you have to get rid of it. The other thing is, is selfishly, I kind of like the no waiting room thing. You know, I, that's, that's been kind of nice. It's worked on our flow in the office. Um, the other thing is, I really like the pre-rents because we we talked about that years ago as that being really important to dental care and we kind of shied away from it and now we're back to it. So I kind of like that. And all these rules come down today and it's like we've been waiting and waiting and waiting for things to change. And I'm kind of like, well, wait a second, I was enjoying some of these, you know? Um, and so what, what are you guys' thoughts on it? And JB, when they lift it in your state and Bill, what are your thoughts? will be the last you know i agree with you on some of it although i don't agree on the waiting room um yeah i still don't like having to call patients in and, yeah. and all that i'll be glad when we have the waiting room back the other things that you mentioned i i tend to agree with um i think it makes sense to be um to err on the, the on the side of caution especially if it doesn't take any effort which neither of those things really do <laughs> No, I think it's a it's a touch point, you know, the day before. And I'm big on touch points with the patient. But when you call the day before and just say, hey, because in, you know, just want to go through a few questions with you, you know, not to bother you or be a nuisance, but we're just trying to keep everybody safe. Then they realize that you're being proactive about this. So I'm OK with that waiting room. I guess I could go either way. I know it is cumbersome to the team and everything like that. But, you know, uh, it, it's, it, I, I'm, I, I'll give that one up, but the other things I kind of like. Yep, I agree. JB? Well, I like the waiting room because in exchange for the waiting room, we've been able to maintain our normal production. So, um, so I have a really small waiting room. And so if I had to, if I had to queue everybody up six feet apart with there are 4,200 kids that they bring in as well. I, mm -hmm. I would only be able to see probably 50% of what we're able to do right now just because of the spacing requirements. So if we could have the waiting room back to normal volume where people could sit in three to four feet proximity to one another, then I'm, I'm happy to open that back up. Um, but I don't want that to be the rate limiting step if I'm doing all the other right things in yep. the back of the house. I just happen to have a small uh, disproportionate waiting room. So, um, but it's also brought so much innovation to dentistry in general. And we're offering 
we've been forced to offer things to patients that maybe we've been reluctant to do, or we didn't want the cost to come along with that, you know, text to pay and, and other things yeah. that have allowed some flexibility for patients that I think, um, yeah, I don't know that will go away. I think it's provided. And, and frankly, we've actually been able to offer work from home opportunities for our front desk staff, which we would have never entertained prior to COVID. But we now have front desk people working from home, answering phones, uh, working down a to-do list of patient communication and all that stuff without having to be physically in the office on a daily basis and finding that that's an, an extremely productive way to utilize their time. So it's forced innovation, which I, I, you know, I don't know what will stick and what will go away, but it's been kind of a, I don't know, an academic exercise in, in business school, so. Well, I would agree. And I think on that note, let's just know that maybe this is a sign that not only did Texas thaw out last week, but maybe there's a glimmer of that light at the end of the COVID tunnel uh, that we can all crawl out of soon and see each other once again. So let's close on that note. Bill, thank you so much for being here. You, uh, you're, you are so fantastic. You're such a light to so many. And we just Thank you so much. It was yeah. indeed a pleasure. It was just great. You know, we don't see each other that often, Chad, so it's really fun to actually see you. And Jennifer, it's obviously been a long time, so uh, see your lovely face. So thank you so much for the opportunity tonight. I really had fun. Well, Thanks for coming on. Thank you for sharing your story with us, and uh, I'm just going to ask if you'll come back again. It would be my pleasure indeed. Seriously, I love this. Right. It's much more fun awesome. than this, you know. Thanks, Bill, and uh, good night, everybody. Thanks for watching, and I will post that link to the Global Diagnosis Study Club. <laughs> <laughs>